All right, yes. thank you, Judy. <laughs> and now, finally, we're ready for the big event of the evening. And before I introduce Jeff, I would like to remind you that the question and answer session will be at the end of his presentation. And all of you can participate, and we hope you will, by typing into your chat function a question. Just say question for Jeff and type it in. And we'll be reading these questions to Jeff at the end of the program. But we're very fortunate to have Jeff. Last year, on the second Tuesday in October, Jeff gave us a wonderful program on birding New Zealand. But New Zealand is by far, far from the only place that Jeff and his wife, Patricia, have gone birding. They've done it all over the world. And we're the fortunate recipients of some of their many stories. Jeff has been an active birder in the Willamette Valley for, since the 1970s. And he's also an eBird reviewer for Lynn in Marion County, as well as for the country of Colombia in South America. And in spite of all these activities, Jeff and Patricia are able to take off multiple times a year birding around the world. And he says, it's not just pleasure. It's not just expanding their knowledge. What it is, is a commitment to helping bird conservation around the world. And you might say, well, how can my traveling to see birds in other countries Tonight, we're going to see pictures of Jeff's from Colombia, from countries in Asia and Africa. How can that help their bird conservation and, and the bird populations around the world? Well, Jeff will give you some ideas. You're on, Jeff. Thank you, Eugenia. You're so kind. Yes, uh, conservation birding. I'm gonna share my screen here and uh, start this program that I call conservation birding. It's your duty to go. The thing is that, that in the hopes of attracting ecotourists to come to their countries and birders in particular, uh, a lot of, of people in small communities and large communities, I suppose, but mostly it's small areas, have set up programs to support birding. And they've, they've invested in these and they've trained themselves. And I would hate to see that effort wasted. So that's why I feel it's, it's your duty to go. I feel it's my duty. Now, I have to say that this year is a little difficult and I actually have not left the continent at all this year, which is very unusual for me. But um, I'm assuming that we'll get back to some semblance of normality and we'll be able to go. And when we can, it'll be our duty to go. The goals of conservation birding, not just to see good birds, and there are a lot of them out there, but also to support habitat preservation and not just supporting, you can you could just send money to uh, the Nature Conservancy or Audubon or other international organizations that support uh, habitat preservation. But the idea is to encourage local support for habitat preservation and, and to encourage local birders. And in addition to support ornithologists in their research, partly because ornithologists are often the uh, people who are guiding. Uh, when you go, their lodging choices are kind of important and, and uh, you like to create local incentives for conserving areas by, uh, by staying in places that are sustainable, that are low impact, 
low investment, locally owned operations. And um, I should say, I should comment that the low investment bit uh, might imply that some of these places are not posh, although some are actually. And the idea of conservation birding is, is not mine alone, nor by any stretch of the imagination. The American Bird Conservancy has a program they call conservation birding, same as me. But um, you can go to their website at conservationbirding.org and they'll tell you a lot about some of the refuges that they support and some of the ways that you can go visit those. They, they'll set it all up for you. Um, one of the things I like about birding, the, the, with conservation birding, you wanna have local guides because they're the people you wanna encourage to be out learning about local birds. Otherwise, uh, we won't know as much without local people there. So in Colombia, uh, Two of my favorites are Diego Calderon and Andrea Morales. Uh, Diego, uh, we were actually Diego's first clients as a guide, Patricia and I. And uh, um, since then, he's built up quite a following and he now leads international tours to not just Costa Rica, uh, but he's been leading trips to Madagascar. Uh, Andrea is, is basically an ornithologist, but she leads tours too. Uh, she's from the Caribbean region in Colombia. Uh, this is when we first met Diego, when another guide, uh, a friend had set up a tour for Patricia and I. And, and at the end, we went to uh, a place called Rio Claro in the Magdalena Valley. And there, we didn't know this was going to happen, but Sergio had us join a ad hoc group of uh, birders. Much as if a guide took you to Malheur and showed up on Memorial Day, there are all these birders there. They're, they're, they were all Colombians, but they were uh, from all walks of life, engineers and students and uh, housewives and um, everything and all just out to enjoy birding, just like you would find at Malheur on Memorial Day. And the thing is that it's fun to travel and be with Colombians. As you can see, they're safety conscious. And uh, it's, it's just fun. Someone who goes to Colombia or any uh, country for the most part, and you don't meet with the locals, you miss something. I've skipped a slide. There we go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, and show you some pictures from some uh, places that I've been that qualify as conservation birding and uh, tell you a little bit about about the place and show you some pretty pictures and, and mention some of the conservation uh, some of the conservation issues that are important for the area. And one of them is called Bocas del Atrato, at the mouth of the Atrato River, which is in the uh, department of Antioquia, same as Medellin in Colombia. And to get there, you have to cross uh, the Gulf, this, this arm of the Caribbean and the southern extent of the Caribbean Sea is called the Gulf of Uraba, and you have to cross it from Turbo, about 30 kilometers. To get there, you go in a small boat. This was 2012. This is Diego here, Diego Calderon, and Patricia getting in this little boat with some local people who had supplies. Uh, this is the normal thing because they go shopping across the Gulf of Urba in uh, uh, people that live there. Uh, and you cross, and here is the um, the Echo Hotel that is owned and managed uh, in, cooperatively by the community, so that the the what you spend benefits the entire community. Uh, the 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 town itself is actually hardly called a town. 
It's one street al along the river that's, that's basically built on dredge spoils. Here's an aerial photograph of the, of the place. You can see that it's one street along this side, a few houses on the other, they have to take a boat across. And uh, that's all it is. And otherwise, this whole area is mangroves. It's the where the, if, if I go back a few to this map, you can see that the, the mouths of the Atrata River have extended out into the Gulf of Urban. And this whole area is just low-lying um, mangrove forests. Um, so there's not much hiking to do there. What you do is get in boats with uh, uh, Diego or your guide or somebody and a local person who pulls you along. Uh, paddles sometimes. Uh, and the birds you're looking for, one is the star called the sooty-capped puffbird up here in the corner. And this is a bird that is only found, this species is only in a narrow range right around this area. It uh, doesn't even get into Panama, which is close by. You also see mealy parrots and northern screamer is a good one. Uh, and black antshrike is a, a town of, as a bird of low-lying uh, Colombia and the Caribbean coast. I should use, uh, getting around, there is a little bit of walking where there are small islands, usually built on dread spoils. And uh, the water rises sometimes and the bridges are a little bit sketchy here and there. Uh, birds that you look for, it's, it's mangroves and uh, you look for the same kind of birds, some of them that are found throughout the Caribbean. Uh, snail kite, little blue heron, yellow crown night heron, and white ibis. One of the things about visiting um, these local communities is you sometimes get a chance to interact with the with the people who live there. These are four girls that came by to see the the uh, foreigners who were visiting their town, and as we sat there on a we were there for several days and sometimes in the afternoon, the birding gets slow. So Patricia and I were hanging out in this covered gazebo and uh, school got out and a bunch of the students that live nearby came to see what these locals were doing. And we had a chance to talk to them about birds and learn what they felt about them and what they, what they knew. They could tell us a thing about what they see. And uh, we spent quite a bit of time there enjoying sharing our books and uh, as we enjoyed the afternoon. Uh, Patricia loaned them her camera and uh, they enjoyed taking pictures of each other and looking through her binoculars. And we had actually quite a nice time. Uh, this is uh, Fauna Darian is the outfit that supports this uh, ecotourism program and you can look at their website and find directions on how to get there. And then uh, just last year, yes. just last year, Patricia and I um, sent, uh, uh, went out to the far east of, of Colombia to the town of Me Too in the state of Valpes. Uh, very close to Brazil and not so far from Venezuela. This is Amazonian jungle. The town looks like any Amazonian town. It's uh, a lot of motorcycles, a lot of people. There you, you would be difficult to drive. You couldn't drive there. You have to fly or go by the river. Most people fly to get there. The hotel isn't in the center of town though. It's in a uh, there are several hotels. The one we stayed at is, is on a quiet residential street. And what you do is, is get up in the morning at six and take off by six o'clock so that you can see birds early on in the uh, small communities. And where you go is out to these communities where you uh, pay a little bit to support the local efforts. And uh, you get to meet some of the people and uh, 
see what they're doing. And one of the things they were doing here is watching Lady and the Tramp. So we gathered, um, one day we went to this, uh, one of these communities and it was raining a little bit. So we had to cool our heels for just a bit. And at this point, I would, there's a video that was made by uh, people promoting tourism and birding in Colombia. And if Mike can cue that video. Hello, Mike. I think Mike has left us, uh, Jeff, and I don't know about those plans. I'm sorry. I, I'll see if I can get him on the phone. I'll see if I can get him on the phone. Okay. Um, yeah, well, that would be well. Um, it didn't work. I could, I could start it from here, but it didn't work very well. There's too, our connection is too slow. And so for ahead. it to come here and then go back to you all. Do you know work. how he started it? Was it from, from the window, from the webinar window? Do you know where it's? Where? No, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, um, all I can think of to do is to uh, send you, send you the link, which I sent once before. Okay. But I'll put it on the chat window. Okay. And then I might be able to bring it up. It'll just. My name is Morgan Hine. I'm a oh. natural history photographer, and I've come to Colombia to explore. That should be it there, Mike or Tim. Um, looking for. So if you click on that and then share your screen, it should work just fine. I'm waiting for it. It's in the chat window. Oh, in the chat window. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. My name is Morgan. Okay. And then share your screen. Yeah. And we'll be in good shape. I got gotcha. you. Uh, okay. I need to go back. And sorry, <laughs> uh, here we Hi. go. I'm, I'm almost there. <laughs> These things happen. Take your time. All right. Yeah, I think this is going to work. I have no doubt. Hi, I'm a natural history photographer, and I've come to Colombia to explore the birds of the Andes, the Pacific, the Llanos Plains, and the Amazon. Come join me and discover why Colombia is the number one in bird species on Earth. We are deep in the Amazon. This is probably the biggest forest I've ever seen. It's like there, there couldn't be enough room for all the life here. The, the, everything just wants to grow and live. It's exactly like my dreams as a kid. We're in an area called Me Too. One of the things very important to this area is that there are a lot of indigenous cultures here. There's more than 26 different languages spoken here by different communities that live in the area. And all of our guides are from different villages. One of our main guards was Miguel, and you can tell that he really loves the birds. Mi pasión actualmente es 
ya sabes. Las aves son muy especiales porque en general ellos disfrutan de alegría. Me encanta sus cantos. Me encantan sus colores de todas las especies. Great eyes. He can see anything flitting about in the forest. The Amazon is one of the biggest rainforest regions of the world, and even if it looks very homogeneous, it's made out of several different habitats. There is terra firma, there is igapo, varsia, white sand forest, and all these habitats are responsible for a huge diversity of birds. This is probably the most physical trip that I've been on in Colombia. Across three days, we hiked uh, about 40 kilometers. It was true jungle, bushwhacking, hiking, climbing over things. While we were here in the Amazon, we probably saw over a hundred species of different birds. But there's so much for us. It's like they've got so many places they can go. So you have to really work for it. You have to stand there and search through these leaves. So you can see a lot of birds. Filming them is a lot different. The birds move so fast and sometimes it's random. You have no idea which direction they're gonna go. It's just instantaneous. A lot of these birds, like the ant bird, and that bird was my nemesis. The whole time we were really trying to see these ant birds and they love to just be down in the bottom of the forest. One of the typical phenomena that you can witness in the Amazon is ant following birds. Several different birds from different families follow these swarms of army ants feeding on the flush prey that they leave behind. One of the birds that I most wanted to see was called the cock of the rock. It's a bird that requires very specific conditions to live in. En mi lengua decimos tambua. Para hacer un avistamiento de gallito de roca toca caminar bastante. You have to put all of your trust and faith in these guys as we're just pushing our way through the jungle for miles and eventually getting to just what seems like this big random boulder in the middle of the jungle. There's a female, Cock of the Rock. She was just there, but uh, she just flew off to the left. We're looking for the bird. Um, we often are going into these huge boulder fields, into these caves. The Guyanan cock of the rock is one of these very dimorphic birds. Females are dull and they use any ledges, any little platforms on rocks to build their nest. Me 
shell cock of the rock is super brightly colored and uh, one of its special things is that it has a crest that covers the bill. Rupicola, Rupicola, its scientific name actually means dwelling on rocks, dwelling on boulders, and that's where they nest. The key takeaway for me from coming to the Amazon is this sense of community. These communities and people are all working together to figure out how to have a tourism business here in the Amazon. Hace ocho años venimos desarrollando un trabajo de rescate y fortalecimiento de, del conocimiento tradicional asociado a las aves. El conocimiento ancestral se basa en la relación que existe el mundo indígena con las aves. Cada especie de aves nos emite un mensaje. Todas, o sea, absolutamente todas dentro de la mitología fueron creadas para algo especial, porque dentro de los indígenas todo tiene vida. Porque ellos lo que quieren es que realmente un beneficio del turismo pueda llegar directamente a la comunidad. Y ha sido muy chévere porque, porque han encontrado otra opción más económica para su sustento familiar. Getting to learn about how the people here live off the land, it was a genuine welcome to my life and my home, and I'm excited to share my life with you. That's something that I hope continues as more people come here. I'm just Frenchy. Pues, para mí es un orgullo que venga gente de extranjero, que conozca cómo vivimos nosotros, que nosotros los indígenas también queremos manejar el turismo, estamos preparados para manejar el turismo y somos capaces de liderar para el turismo. Did I stop it too early? No, good job, Tim. I'm going to share. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint now. Um, so, yeah, this is Miguel here that we, we were with, and he is a wonder to watch in the field the way he stalks birds and goes into full indigenous uh, hunting mode when when he's on one to to be able to show it to you and he's he's it, it was fun to be with him just like it is most times when we're, you're with Colombians i suppose all birders are kind of fun to be with but something different about colombians somehow and uh, uh, yeah here's a black caracara and some black capped uh, parrots looking like a evil lord and his minions but anyway to go on another place we went more recent or uh, uh, March in March 2005 was Sarah Cerro El Inglés and this was a place that our friend Sebastian Moreno wanted to go see uh, it's because it's in the it's in the western Andes. Let me go back to there. It's in the western range of the Andes, and and it's in this is called the Choco bioregion. We were on the edge of the actual state of Choco, which is here, and in uh, but we were in uh, Valle de Cauca most of the time on the the eastern slope of the western Andes, uh, and uh, sorry about the. Uh, that the the lodge is set up by the community uh, that that supports this. It's their it's a reserve that they have partly to protect their water system to make sure there's no pollution in the town's water, as many reserves like this are. But as long as uh, as long as you don't disturb the water, then you, tourism is fine is fine there, and, and looking for birds is quite wonderful. The star here is a small bird called the Munchiki wood wren, um, 
which is only found in this stretch of the Western Andes, doesn't even reach to uh, Ecuador. Uh, another bird we saw is the yellow-breasted ant pitta, more widely distributed, but the guide was able to pull it in by whistling and uh, it showed up, uh, showed up for us. Dusky chlorospingus is another uh, bird that, that we found, uh, another endemic of the Choco bioregion. The Choco itself extends into Ecuador, of course, and the Choco is among the rainiest places on earth. It, it sometimes has more rain than any place else. Sometimes it's, it's Kauai and sometimes it's Nepal, but between those three, uh, no other area comes even close in the amount of rain. So it, it's pretty wet there. And we slogged for several kilometers up this muddy trail. One thing we found there, this is not real well explored territory. And as we were walking along, Patricia noticed this orchid blooming beside the trail in standing water, as it happens. It's a terrestrial orchid, and there's nothing else like it in the world. There are some six members of its genus, and this is a new one, which she and Sebastian Moreno wrote up uh, the formal description, Pseudocentrum glabrum, and it'll forever bear her name as the initial describer, and I'm quite proud of that. But this is the way you go birding often, is you wear rain gear, and it, it's frankly difficult because your optics fog up and you have to be very careful about your camera, uh, but there are good birds out there and it's, it's just playing a lot of fun. The sun comes out, you can see we put off our raincoats here, still a little dampish, uh, lunch there and in many places uh, is uh, chicken and rice wrapped in a banana leaf, uh, which you carry in your backpack. And one of the birds we saw was the cinnamon flycatcher here. We also saw masked trogons and smoke colored peewees. And Sebastian in this was, was photographing not birds, but or the horse shit that's in the foreground, but actually butterflies. And the butterflies can be quite spectacular, as, as, as you can see here. This is called a vague number wing, and the upper side and the underside are quite different. Uh, so another place we've been is way in the south, still in the western range of the Andes, still the Choco bioregion, which extends into Ecuador, is Rio Nyambi. We were there just uh, uh, three years ago in October 2017. This reserve, uh, you have to walk in. It's about five kilometers up kind of a rough trail and you have to carry your stuff. But once you get there, it's a lovely lodge and uh, accommodations are just dreamlike practically. Here you are in the middle of nowhere and they serve you breakfast and dinner and coffee for breakfast. It's just a, wonderful. Some of the things we saw include ornate flycatcher, the white cap dipper, brown inca. Uh, here we are in a group along the river, rufous motmot and the rufous throated tanager, which is another western Andes endemic. Another place, here's the, this was a good place, another uh, reserve that protects the water supply for the whole town of Buenaventura, which is one of Colombia's bigger towns. It's the sea, it's a sea coast. That's the, on, the only good, good uh, uh, harbor on the Pacific coast for Colombia. And there's a good road going down from Cali. When our guide, uh, to set up this, we, we asked Diego Calderon uh, to arrange something and he, he set us up with a, with a guide named um, Constantino. Um, what was his first Emilio. name? Emilio, yes, Emilio Constantino. And he was asking if we wanted to go to this place, San Cipriano. The drawback is that you have to, we park the truck and you have to 
put your luggage on a cart and it's something about going on a railroad and it wasn't really clear why it would be difficult or why we would not want to go. But um, it now, and, and he spoke good English. He actually went to high school in for one year in, as an exchange student in Alsea, Oregon. So he was familiar with where we're from. But we said we would, uh, we, we weren't sure what he was talking about, but we said we would. And, and uh, when we got there and unloaded our luggage from the, uh, from the truck, it turned out this was the cart we were going to go on that rides on the tracks. It's essentially a pallet that's suspended on one side by a motorcycle and on the other side by basically skateboard wheels. And uh, you sit on it and your luggage is there and uh, uh, basically that's it. It was about 10 kilometers down the railroad tracks and uh, we had the deluxe version. Some didn't have uh, benches that were nailed down, but ours were, so we felt secure. We had to wonder sometimes uh, what you would do if something happened, whether it's tuck and roll or just what, uh, as you barrel down the, the railroad tracks. And of course, there's only room for one cart. You see someone else coming. When the two meet, someone has to get off the tracks and take their cart off. And it, there was no regular program for deciding who was the one to get off. So if you met somebody, there was sometimes an, an, a bit of an argument, never very heated, but an argument about who had uh, priority here. Uh, sometimes they were quite large. Of course, this is several carts strung together, still driven by one motorcycle for, um, for many people, this is mostly local, local traffic from uh, Buenaventura or from the town of San Cipriano itself, going back to town for supplies. And, and like I say, it's a long and you cross, you cro it's a long route and you cross the river and come to this little town entirely built from material that was brought on these carts by the railroad, by the railroad track. And uh, so this qualifies as low investment uh, lodging, uh, but you find you have everything you need. You see there's a fan. There were, I don't see insect nets, uh, but I believe we did have mosquito netting, you know, although I don't remember whether it, it was, was an issue. It's there, it's in the picture. Ah, Patricia tells me it's in the picture and a, a private restroom right there. So you've got everything you need. And nearby is a reserve that protects the water supply for the town of Buenaventura. So it's, it's wonderful, pristine tropical forest, very low elevation. So where Sarah El Inglés was a little bit on the cool side at high elevation, this is uh, a little bit steamy and uh, it, it did rain and you have to be ready for uh, wet temperature. Now, here's another aerial photograph of the area. San Cipriano is down here at the bottom and the route we took came from um, the, the left side here and down this way. But I'm gonna show you some things going on up here. Upstream from this, this place, which protects the water supply for Buenaventura, um, there's a mining project. And it's not the kind of mining project that's run by an organization that, that follows environmental guidelines. This is ad hoc citizen mining um, that is run by people who are not run by, I don't know who it's run by, but it's just done by workers who just need some something to do for income. And, uh, I show you these pictures, it's a little disturbing. Uh, you can see that 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 the that river, that stretch of the river may never recover. And, and this is one of the points about conservation birding is that, that the locals need to have an incentive or, or, or they have to have an incentive and a desire to, to support an environment that's not degraded in order for 
people to fight projects like that and to push back when such mining is proposed and other, other problems with the environment. Uh, you need to have the local people bought in on conservation, otherwise it's very difficult. And now the lodging there was a little bit de class A. So I'm gonna take you to another place we went um, in November of 2012 uh, on a beach. This was also on the Pacific coast. If, to get here, you fly to Nuki and take a boat a couple hours south on the coast to get to a lodge that is situated just right on the beach. And you just couldn't have a more pleasant place to be. A lot of the cabanas are, are small. This is two, two rooms here. And there's a, there's a main lodge where you eat your uh, meals. And, and this is all powered by solar uh, with the addition of, um, there's a water turbine that powers a freezer so that you can keep beer cool. And the interesting thing was he had a, power takeoff so he could run a blender from this so that your margaritas would be uh, correct. The, this is off grid, as I say. There was a cell phone signal though, if you went out on these rocks at, at uh, low tide, although sometimes you had to climb to the very top. Usually you could get a signal at this lower level. Sometimes you had to go clear to the top in order to find out what was going on. Good birds we saw there included the black-cheeked woodpecker and the golden-collared mannequin, uh, pied puffbird, and the red-legged honeycreeper. The local people also have uh, uh, a program to take people into the low-lying rivers to look for, um, for birds and lives, uh, uh, life in the uh, very low-lying, this is tidally influenced, that's how low it is. And uh, I want to point out that these people are waiting there for us. They've uh, set up these programs. Some of them are supported. You can see down here in the corner, USAID supported this uh, ecotourism project. And that would be basically us, our tax dollars. And that's why we need to go to encourage this sort of thing instead of the mining. It's not just South America either. Uh, my brother and I in 2008 went to Botswana and there we contact, we, we set up a guide with, uh, who was a, a native Botswana uh, man uh, raised in a crawl in the edge of the Okavanga Delta. And uh, he took us to this place called Mirobi camp, Biroba camp, which was operated by the Okavanga Polars Trust, an organization set up to organize the people that run tours, polling tours in Mokoros out in the Okavanga, Okavanga Delta. We were there in November, 2008. And uh, so you have a nice young man in a homemade dugout canoe pull you along through the marsh uh, where you can see the kids fishing and see good birds like the Malachite Kingfisher and Greater Painted Snipe, African Jasana, Crowned Lapwing. There, one of the benefits to getting a local person to guide you is you get to hang out and, and deal with uh, um, people who are from there. Our, our guide was, was Lucky Garanamozzi and, and we had Moses for a cook. And it was basically Lee and I and these two guys, four guys out camping. And it was a lot of fun and we learned a lot. We learned something about them and the way they live ordinarily. And I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. We went about in this uh, big, safari, open safari vehicle, just the four of us. And we did see, Patricia made sure I put in uh, some non-birds that we saw. There were lions and 
oxpeckers. That's not a that's a bird there. The hippos are just just support for them. Leopards and wild hunting dogs, giraffes and zebras. Another time, Lee and I, and the, the next day, we decided to go every two years to some place. Uh, and we, we went to Borneo next, to uh, in the Malaysian state of Sabah, and uh, stayed at Uncle, and we traveled up the Kinabatangan River and stayed at Uncle Tan's jungle camp. And this is a low lying uh, river system where um, there are good birds like the rhinoceros hornbill. And the conservation issue here in Borneo and along the Kinabatangan River especially is there, that there are a lot of these forests that look thick and healthy, but every once in a while, if you look here on this side, there's uh, the forest has been cleared right down to the river. Well, when that happens, there's a population of orangutans that lives in these forests. And this cuts the population in two or in many parts, if there are many uh, places it's broken. They really need an unbroken stretch of riparian forest uh, along, along the river. In a, and every time it's broken, that cuts the population and cuts their ability to communicate because they can't cross where there's no forest, they stay up in the trees. So by going there, and, and it's the only way you can create incentives for the local people to discourage the farmers from cutting uh, their, the forest down, right down to the river. See, all he would have to do was to have left this little patch of land between here and the next part uh, as a forest and the orangutans could still communicate as it is it's difficult for them. And China, uh, Lee and I, the next time we went out in 2013 uh, was to see uh, uh, Southwest China, the, the Yunnan area. And we visited uh, a natural park. We reached out for this trip, we reached out to a company called Wild China. Lee insisted that we have a biologist with us the whole time. So we had a man named Han from Kunming who studied mammals and birds. And uh, in addition to the guide, the regular regional guide and a driver, Han was with us for the whole three weeks. And it was wonderful to talk with him about the birds and his experience stu studying them and uh, also the other uh, animals, including this gibbon, of which there are only 200 individuals of the Skywalker Hulock gibbon. It was recently described, it wasn't recently discovered, they knew they were there, but they were determined to be a different species from the other Hulock gibbons, and the Chinese team that named them were happened to be Star Wars fans, so this is the Skywalker Hulak Gibbon, and the name in Chinese uh, has to do with brachiation and, and mo moving through the treetops. Very lovely lodge there, and I still feel that it's the same where every person that goes there provides incentive for the government and the local people to maintain these forests as a place you can go see. These were by the way, rhododendron forests. There are some of the blooms you can see here, but it was actually quite spectacular when we were there. Um, last year, another place that uh, Patricia and I went was in Northern Peru. There's a uh, Northern Peru birding route they talk about that they're trying to promote uh, that goes from Chiclao on the, on the Pacific coast in the dry region at, uh, of the Tumbes, crossing the Andes through Cajamarca and down to Moyobamba in the Amazonian side. For this, we reached out to ICAM Expeditions. Now, we were, we were in this area 
many years ago, about 12 years before, and to find a guide who would take us to see the marvelous spatula tail, a hummingbird that's only found in this area, we reached out to a, a guide named uh, Gunnar Engblom, who's a German who lives in Peru, and, and uh, he couldn't take us himself, but he set us up with a young man, Julio Tello, uh, who's seen here, and they um, set up this tour, and we're featured on their website. You can see Patricia here pointing out a bird while I'm there with my mouth open. And Carlos Chiculin is uh, uh, the guy, the guide Julio. Um, Julio didn't come with us, but he felt Carlos knew more about orchids that we were looking for as well. One of the places we went is Reserva Wimbo, which is uh, uh, supported by the American Bird Conservancy and a Peruvian partner called Ecoan. It's, it's an example of community-based conservation. The land's owned by the community and managed for conservation in partnership with these NPOs. And it's protected and all tourism products pro profits are distributed amongst community members. The interesting thing is that this very morning, there was an article in Huffington Post about that reserve and how one of the world's rarest hummingbirds is helping save the cloud forests of Peru. The uh, subtitle, The Marvelous Spatula Tail Hummingbird Inspired a Culture of Conservation in the Andes Mountains. And what the author is saying is that, is that in working to preserve this bird, they interested the locals in doing it and it, how important it is to involve the community and make sure that there's a uh, something in it for the for the local community that gets them interested in conservation and they say there's like a conservation contagion that spreads out and part of that contagion is is by us going down there they see when we say wow look at that they see in how valuable their own things are that they may not have appreciated. And uh, um, so it's not just your tourism dollars. They're not looking at just the dollars. They're looking at through it, looking at their own place through your eyes and saying, wow, you know, this is pretty special here. Let's see if we can do something to keep it. My own photograph of the marvelous spatula tail isn't quite as nice, but there it is. In 1985, my brother Lee and I, this was our first, well, anyway, one of our first international trips. We did it because our mother said that she wanted to see Machu Picchu. And uh, she was 84 at the time and blind, legally blind. You can see here's her... Uh, cane with the red tip. Um, and we took her here, we took her to Cusco and to uh, Machu Picchu and ended the trip down in this community-based reserve called Posada Amazonas on the Madre de Dios River, right near the border with Bolivia and just south of Brazil, where local people and this all the the profits from this project which is actually quite luxurious i want to point out this room has an open side and my mother still talks about um having being open to the uh jungle there and how she could hear the jungle noises her she just passed her 100th birthday by the way in september um and she enjoyed it partly because this lodge is so well designed. Uh, once it was difficult to get her from the river up to the lodge, but once she was there, it was all on one level and there were broad pathways and she had no problem getting from the room to the, to the dining. And Lee and I could, could take a guide and go out on the river or go for a hike or go up in the canopy tower and, and know that she was just fine. We spent several days 
And she had a marvelous time, as well as we did, seeing things like the lettered Arisari at the Canopy Tower and uh, Watkins on the, on the nearby Oxbow Lakes. It was marvelous. And like I say, it was, uh, <coughs> it was run by the local people for their benefit. Uh, they told us that it was funding streets and roads and schools. And this, this uh, medical clinic is what this is. This happens to be the uh, indigenous medicine man along with our bird guide. Uh, so it's a program that uh, is working out for them. It's still managed by uh, Rainforest Alliance, a Canadian company, but um, they, the profits accrue to the, uh, to the indigenous, the local community. It is a little bit expensive, but it was easily worth it. So how do you do conservation birding? For me, I think it's important to start with local operators um, and, and to ask them about community-based ecotourism. And you can search for these things online. Back in 2004, when I was planning that trip to Posada Amazonas, I planned the whole thing online and found this uh, uh, wonderful echo lodge down there. And, and we didn't particularly need uh, anybody to help work it out. Um, I have to say that the way I do these trips though, I don't see every single bird. And if a person is out to maximize the list of birds they see on this trip, and they're that focused on their uh, life list, then you wanna choose a bird birding focused operator. For instance, the conservation birding program of the American Bird Conservancy. They, you can go to that website at conservationbirding.com and look at the kind of, uh, of uh, preserves that they protect. And, and uh, it's really easy to get something set up. If you choose to go with one of the major bird tour companies, <coughs> they're very good. There's no question about that. And they will surely make sure that you see all the necessary birds. But you want to ask them if they have local guides and you want to ask them about uh, community-based ecotourism and where, what kinds of places they stay. So uh, basically that's it. I'm closing with a sunset, sunset on Yavin 4, uh, taken a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> There you go. Uh, what kind of questions do we have? Okay, well, thank you so much, Jeff. That sounds like an awful lot of marvelous trips. Um, one of the first questions is, how much does it cost for such a trip? Of course, you've talked about a wide range, but still, can you give us some idea of the cost factors? Well, I can, um, you know, when, um, do, you, do you remember, Patricia, what Peru cost with? The one we did last for three the, weeks? The 10-day program crossing the Andes with? It, it was it was $200 a day. It was it was a little more than $200 a day. And, per, and per, per, for the two of them? Per us. person. Oh, no, was it, I don't think it was $400 a day. You think it was $400? Well, that might be. You might be right. Two hundred dollars a day per person. That's kind of what I shoot for: is two hundred dollars a day per person. It's it's not unreasonable. Uh, we can't always do it. Sometimes we do better. But Patricia and I have an advantage because we have so many Colombian friends, and uh, um, so some of them, you know, we don't get a full charge for a guide. They like to go with us. Turns out. Uh, young biologists really like to show Patricia around because she finds good orchids like that uh, uh, pseudocentrum where we found at Sierra El Inglés. Uh, and that's an advantage not everybody has. But still, if you go to uh, Diego Calderon and ask him to set something up, uh, I think you could probably get away something like $300 a day. Uh, I noticed that the companies like Wings and... Uh, 
field guides, it tends to be $400 a day or more. And that's rough. Uh, mm -hmm. Anybody correcting me, uh, I'd be happy to listen. I don't have experience with uh, those operations, so I can't speak to them. Well, you have wonderful experiences doing what you're doing. Um, Tim says, how do you find the local guides and accommodations and travel arrangements for the areas you want to visit? Well, that's, that's, that's a good question. And, and like I say, Patricia and I have an advantage, but for instance, when we first went to Peru, we contacted a, a reliable guide who was a foreigner to Peru, Gunnar Engblom, uh, and he set us up with a, just a few day trip with uh, Julio uh, Tello at, at um, ICAM Expeditions. And, uh, but once we'd done that, when we wanted to go again, we reached out to, to Julio himself and he set up a wonderful tour. Same thing with China. Uh, we, um, he found this wild China commercial outfit and asked them specifically to, um, to find a biologist to go with us. And we had a few extra days at the end. It turns out that Han himself would had a little bit of a tour company operation and, and he took us out for a few days, but much lower cost. With Botswana, it happened that uh, Lee knew someone who had been on safari as a hunter and he recommended their outfitter. Their outfitter uh, recommended, uh, set us up with the guide but I had learned online about a guide in, in Botswana named, who is called Mr. Fish. And I asked about that. And um, the guy, the op, Mr. Fish was not available, but his nephew, Lucky Garanamotsi was. And that turned out to be a wonderful thing because uh, Lucky knew the bird calls and was able to whistle in some things that we might otherwise not have seen. Carolyn Holman asks, do you speak Spanish and do you recommend it for this kind of birding? Or in general, how much did you find you were having problems communicating on your trips? We speak a little Spanish sufficient for tourism. And uh, I think in the years we've gotten a little better. Um, when even the first time when we went with with Julio Tello of, of ICAM Expeditions, um, we made an effort to use Spanish the whole time. And uh, we've come to be better. They, it, it turns out your Spanish doesn't need to be very good for, the, for communication to occur. Um, and I feel they appreciate if you try to speak some Spanish but it's not necessary. It's certainly not necessary with Diego Calderon, who spent an exchange year in university in exchange. Dublin. More than a year he was there. He was more than a year, yeah. Patricia says, in Dublin. So his English is real good, but you heard him speak uh, on the video. And of course he set us up with, with Emilio Constantino, who spent a year in high school in Alsi, so you know his English was pretty good. And uh, it's a little variable, but for the most part, people will speak English. That, that's been our experience. Okay. Teresa Byrne asks, what were the people digging holes alongside the river mining? What were they digging for? Oh, you didn't tell them. Uh, didn't I say that was a gold mine operation? Um, so they were not just disturbing the river, but they were probably using mercury to extract the gold from the soil. And it, it's really quite damaging. And this is why we need a constituency for, um, for a clean environment. Well, and on that same vein, Michael Babbitt says, some folks think travel itself causes too much environmental damage. 
uh, he wonders if it's a question of balance. Is it beneficial overall to visit other countries? Any thoughts? I, I believe it is. I believe that, uh, that reaching out to foreign countries is, is almost imperative to maintain world peace and to make sure um, that people understand, well, people understand each other, really. Um, so you're right. The, I understand that jet travel is, is uh, polluting and it's, it's, uh, an, it's a, it, it affects climate change. Um, all I can say is you can mitigate in your ordinary life. Here in Oregon, Patricia and I live, live very simply and hardly travel anywhere. This year, we're making up for a lot of years traveling because we just stay home. But um, I think that it would, if we don't go, they won't understand how important their place is to the world. Yeah. And I, I, I will confess that I might just be rationalizing something I want to do anyway. But I don't think so. I think that it actually does help to get out there and let these the people in other countries see their place through our eyes so that they understand how valuable what they have is. Teresa Byrne again says, are most of the guides you used able to support themselves and their families solely by leading birding trips? I don't know all that they do, so I'm not sure I can answer that categorically, but it certainly helps them. And a young biologist um, who's, who, for instance, Sebastian Moreno does, does have work, but it doesn't pay as much as guiding us would. Um, and, uh, uh, he does surveys. There is work for biologists in uh, in in South America, and uh, it's the same with Julio Tellas, Tella and uh, uh, Carlos Chiquilin that took us in Peru last year. Uh, they both work as biologists. Uh, it's just not not as lucrative as as uh, having a foreigner pay you. So that is a very strong benefit to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Michael Badmit also adds to your rationalizations that world peace does have a lot to say for itself as well. <laughs> so he, th he doesn't think you're rationalizing too, too much. Well, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. Catherine says, my experience in Africa, a tip is very nice and expected. Is that true in South America? Oh, well, we are the worst tippers. Yeah, it turns out that Patricia and I are probably the worst tippers in the world, other than in restaurants uh, here in the United States. Uh, I kind of feel that somebody... Uh, uh, especially uh, uh, someone who's in business for themselves should charge us what it's worth for the job. And we do tip. Um, we did give some extra money to uh, more than bargain for in uh, Me Too when we were there to the, to the people that drove us around and the local guide, Miguel. Um, but I don't know. I'm 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 a pinch penny basically, but I reward good service. Uh -huh. Lucky Garen Amozzi, It seems to me that I gave him my scope at the end uh -huh. um, because he didn't have a good one, and there was there was a problem with it that I wanted to get a new one anyway. <laughs> That's quite a nice tip. It, I I thought it was okay. John Matthews wants to know about our current situation. Given the pandemic restrictions to travel, what 
steps are being taken by the American Bird Conservancy and their partners down to the local guides and birding tours so that the programs can continue and uh, continue to provide financial income for the hosts in lodgings and, and for the guides. Um, I can't answer that. I don't know what uh, American Bird Conservancy is doing. Um, I do know that Diego Calderon and some of his, his birding colleagues in Colombia reached out to their <coughs> whole mailing list and asked for contributions, not for them, but for the local community level people who are running these things. And they did provide a little bit of support. I gave them a minor amount. Uh, embarrassingly small, frankly, but I put in. Uh, but I don't know if American Bird Conservancy or other similar organizations is doing that because they're basically hurting down there right now. Yeah. I did did get a regular mailing from Gunnar Engblom in, in Peru saying that they're planning to open up and he's hoping people will <coughs> come to Peru and uh, I don't know how safe it is as far as the COVID-19, they had quite an outbreak, but um, at least they're, they're opening up and it, it's up to you as to whether you want to go now. Carolyn Holman asks you, what kind of effects and responses to climate change have you seen in various places? And do the guides talk about it? They do a little bit. When we're in Colombia, there's been a uh, there have been changes in some of the weather patterns, and it seems like when we, you and I were talking about Colombia and uh, asking when the when the best time to go is, and it turns out that that may be changing because there have been periods of drought during a time of year they didn't expect that. And, and, and they think that that's a matter of uh, climate change. Um, for better or worse. So they are aware that, that there could be uh, changes coming. And you know, low-lying areas like Bocas del Atrato, they have to be aware that sea levels might rise. It's the same in Nuki although the, the mountains rise steeply from uh, uh, Coqui on the Pacific coast and San Cipriano is not down at sea level, but they were absolutely at sea level in Bocas del Atrato. And uh, probably some of the same at, uh, in Borneo where we were on the uh, Kinabatangan River is not high above sea level. Mm -hmm. So I think they're aware that these changes are happening and little concerned, but uh, they, like anybody else, they're not sure what they can do. I was wondering about your biologist, Han, in China. Uh, what were his primary concerns about the environment? And was he optimistic or pessimistic? <clears throat> well, I have to say he's an optimist. Um, he, uh, we didn't, I'm, I'm not sure we got into that discussion uh, very much. Um, it was some time ago. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure I can really speak to that. Um, Lee maintains correspondence. I could ask him. Be interested. Dorothy um, Kimball wants to know, have you visited either Madidi, hopefully I pronounced that okay, or the river Mamore in Bolivia. There are lodges at both set up by Spain and now run by indigenous people in the area. Local guides are well trained, fly in from La Paz. So that Madidi is M-A-D-I-D-I. -I. These are in Bolivia. I have never been to Bolivia and I'm glad to know about that because I want to go when I can given the current travel situations. But uh, 
That's wonderful. And I assume such places are there in most countries. Well, it's interesting that they were set up by Spain and now run by indigenous people. That's true. That's very interesting. And um, another question that John Matthews had was, and I'm searching for it. Uh, what, well, what kind of camera gear do you like to carry? on these trips i've been carrying i've been carrying a small uh, uh digital uh point and shoot they call it with an ultra zoom right now i have a nikon b700 nikon cool picks is it b700 that just slings over it well i don't wear it over my shoulder anymore i dropped it too often for that i have to wear it around my neck uh uh uh, but uh, I find it convenient and easy to use. And, and if I do drop it, I'm not out several thousand dollars. They cost about 500. And you can get them repaired for about 150. So wow. and I've done that. So because I'm out in the field, I'm not always careful enough with my gear. And you're in not the um, poshest of circumstances in travel like carrying them on the uh, sidecars with on the railroad with the motorcycle uh, that, following you. That, very true. And I, I don't, uh, yeah, I get out there basically and uh, go places where it can be difficult. Well, it's the same with binoculars. I, I don't, have a two thousand dollar pair of binoculars because I I just feel that the the difference between that and my five hundred dollar Nikon's will buy a plane ticket somewhere and I'd rather yeah. spend my money traveling and even if you I guess they're guaranteed so but I've always said even if you'll still leave a pair of binoculars like that on the roof of the car someday and there it goes yeah. Well, but there are arguments all kinds of ways and I'm probably just too pinch penny. Speaking of the money, Tim Johnson wants to know if the $200 per day includes food and lodging. I yes, does. That, that's, yeah, that's pretty much everything. Uh, and it's just a round number. Sometimes we get away less than that, sometimes a little bit more. Yeah. So it's not a contract, right? <laughs> I'm not guaranteeing that. That's a guideline that I use that I like to see. Uh-huh. Makes sense. Well, that pretty much takes care of the questions. If you're able to stay for sharing, more things might come up. Um, when people can speak for themselves. But we thank you so much for this fascinating talk. And... It's given us reason to look with favor on our own trips to watch birds, which is great. Well, thank, so thank you for you. having me. I, I think I will stick around. Wonderful. Uh, then we are going to have our traditional break, but unfortunately we're not se serving any juice or punch for it tonight. I see Jeff has his coffee cup or something. Um, so you have to provide your own refreshments. It's only going to be a very few minutes because what we're doing is allowing those people who want to leave to leave. And in that case, you'll want to click leave meeting. Although if you do it by mistake, then you can click the cancel button that's near the, near leave the meeting, but the red leave the meeting uh, button. And then those people who have not left, we Tim is going to get to work happily unmuting you and you know making you full-fledged participants. And Kathy Patterson is going to lead us in our traditional sharing of bird discussion, sightings, experiences, questions. So thanks so very much, Jeff. 
and um, we'll all reconvene in about three minutes. Thank you. Can I get you something?